I'm Trish Anderson, Director of Quality and Performance Improvements, and one of my strategies is to see reduction in harm of all of our community members um, as they visit our emergency departments. And so that's um, as our hospitals participate in the federal government called the HIN contract. Um, I work with the facilities to see what things we can do to help reduce harm to our, our community. So the personal story that touches me and keeps me motivated in this work is that one of our babysitters, very young babysitters um, in the previous community I lived in, was obtaining prescription uh, opioids and other medications every time she went to babysit in um, all of the locations uh, throughout our community. Um, she and she did end up dying um, as related to that uh, uh, use and misuse. And so it wasn't her prescription. Um, she had also um, some behavioral health components to her her underlying disorder in that she was self-medicating uh, for and um, you know just a such a loss. So you know these are our friends, these are our babysitters, these are our teens, um, our grandparents, as we've all talked about. And I try and keep her in the forefront of my mind every day when I'm working on this, uh, this initiative. Um, so I work with hospitals, 119 of them, some of them in Oregon, all uh, in Washington and some in Alaska, to uh, help, address our health, help our hospitals address the opioid crisis. Uh, the policy person I just flashed um, on our side, on the Washington State Hospital Association side, thank you, uh, and Jeb's partner, um, as we work together on policy formation is Ian Corbridge, who wasn't able to be here with us today. Um, so I just wanted to let you know who he was, so thanks. All right, so I just want to talk about moving forward and aligning and collaboration and some asks of the accountable community of health here in, um, in this area. Um, so I, Jeb talked, touched on this a little bit. Um, this is the sphere that I work in. Um, I ask the leadership of hospitals and communities um, to participate in the guidelines that were developed uh, for our state in terms of uh, acute and chronic pain prescription. Um, and then we help to uh, have conversations about how to move to practice changes. And we're gonna do that through uh, data and accountability. So, um, you know, you can see the partnership that's developed. This is the framework that we work within. And um, some, of the, some of the asks will be there. Um, we also work uh, to promote that the emergency room is for emergencies. Um, and so we would like the best utilization of those emergency room and the physicians that are there. Um, so that is part and parcel some of the work we've done. Uh, I think I'll just skip over any other legislative um, detail except for we do have full access to the PMP uh, data. So the prescribing monitoring program data set. And so from there, we're gonna look for that you're just a meaningful um, uh, educational pieces that can drive change for our physicians and other prescribers like PAs and nurse practitioners. And we continue to go out and educate and support the practice changes. Um, so here, um, as the, we, you know, ACHs were coming into formation, we talked about what could we partner around and align with, and there were six priorities that came out initially um, as we convened um, all across the state. And then um, we decided to focus on three where we could th thought we could make the biggest uh, impact. And so those are highlighted there for you um, from a Washington State Hospital Association and Medical Association. So the first aim, is that overdose per, uh, prevention, so naloxone dispensing right out of our emergency department. Naloxone is uh, an agent that reverses uh, an opioid, um, and uh, so there's a number of methods that we can get that out into our community. Um, that can be dispensed through pharmacists um, and um, with some stipulations, so we can help get that stood up in your community, as well as working with your ED physicians to um, get the supply out into the families, and or um, in needle exchange programs is often very successful to um, distribute uh, Narcan kits to um, people who are using uh, opioids um, and that that's a good place to have that conversation with them and, and uh, send them out with a, a Narcan, or Narcan or Naloxone, pardon me, um, kit for re, uh, reversal agent. 
Um, some of the hospitals struggle with this, so I'm going to put my ask rate in here. Um, they, they won't be able to continue to distribute uh, naloxone um, kits. There is a cost to it, and um, so there's their ability to partner with that with the ACHs to come alongside and make sure there's a, a naloxone in the community, not th not only with the law enforcement and uh, ambulance service, um, uh, but how do we get it well distributed? Um, so uh, we hope to reduce opioid do overdose deaths and um, through continued penetration of the, the kits being available in our community, especially in high risk areas, so, or with opioid naive people. Um, so we just work on pro our process, you know, what are some good policies to come around that. When we do see a patient in the emergency department, um, we are trying, we are working to stand up um, medicated, uh, medication assisted therapies um, that get started right in the emergency room. Um, but then the ask of um, our ACHs is, that do we have enough services um, for that patient to continue and care transitions um, to continue on with that, that MAT um, when they've come to us in the emergency, in that emergent state, and um, continue to connect them with services in their community. So um, just in some regions, we, we think we have some services, but we don't think we have enough. Um, so uh, in that ask is also, um, how do we measure what's available for our patients? How do we do that standardly across all ACHs so that we can help guide and ask for either future funding and resources or um, ad really identify where resources need to be allocated? I think that was covered before. So, um, and then the kind of final arm that we're tackling at the Washington State Hospital Association is improving the opioid prescribing. Um, I think we've talked a lot about the opioid feedback reports. They're going to get a little more nuanced as we move forward with this new relationship with uh, uh, receiving the PMP data. And um, we're going to thoughtfully go forward, as, as uh, Nathan indicated, that you know, with every action there's an, uh, unintended consequences or, or, or reactions. So um, we want to be thoughtful as we move forward with, with uh, feedback reports. Um, but with those feedback reports, um, uh, in, in the uh, House Bill 1427, they're not to be utilized for a punitive purpose. They're be utilized to drive um, hospitals and providers back to what are common guidelines? Are there reasonable exceptions? It's to educate and have a conversation around uh, with providers, specialty groups, and facilities, systems, um, which are all part of our, our community. So um, I really think the success of all of our work depends on each other. And so I wanted to put a graphic together to kind of represent how we all overlap. I, I couldn't figure out where to put community except for in the bigger picture. Um, um, and it will take us all aligned and collaborating, measuring the same thing, determining our successes, um, and having continued dialogue about where we can, um, what, what isn't working as well as what, what else needs to be done. Um, so this is my contact information. Um, I just want to make sure I summarize my points, my asks while I was here. Um, so it's really around um, naloxone, so funding some of the, you know, just getting that out into our communities um, as we started in the, dispensing it in the emergency departments, um, continuing to support facilities who are um, dispensing naloxone, um, looking to increase the number of providers that are providing medicated assisted therapies across our community, and then continuing that care transition and services um, for their ongoing success in that program, and then um, just keep coming together to talk about meaningful metrics uh, that will uh, you know, demonstrate our success or point us to where we need to do things differently. So I really appreciate your time um, today and being here to um, hear what we're working on in terms of op the opioid crisis, and uh, I'm going to open it up to questions. A perfect timing for either one of us. This is my contact information. My uh, email is a little catchier. It's Trisha at Wisha <laughs> uh, org. Um, so I can get a hold of Jeb if uh, if you um, want to recall that one instead. So, do you have any? Uh, let's open it up for questions. We have five minutes, uh, and I know we must have questions. Yes. I have a question. I want to first of all compliment you on what you said. 
people that are killing them are people like me, the physicians who are doing it. Especially the old ones. Oh my God, yes. That's one of the uh, <laughs> lectures I gave to our residents last week. I said, look at the age of your physician. When they started, did they start training in 1996? Between now, they're the danger. They run from these people, which includes myself, of course. But the what we're doing here at Peace and Health is we've taken your numbers, the 42 and 18, mm -hmm. we cut them in half. Mm -hmm. We're gonna push our doctors from, from the start, even surgery. The data for our surgeons, 15 uh, pills of pick your strength will take care of 80% of the post-op pain mm -hmm. when they go home. Yeah. We didn't see a reason to go higher. So we're pushing those numbers as low as we can. Then you brought up an important thing. Mm -hmm. That the other thing we were we got our hospitalists trained to uh, when they come in on Savox or a map, they mm -hmm. now know what to do. You don't shut them off, you tell them how to manage it. They have my phone number 24 hours a day to get yeah. through it. Then we were looking at your department, the ED, because we wanted you guys to get them on Savox or everything. Mm -hmm. But you know, if we did that, come Monday, where did they go? Mm -hmm. yep. We had a huge gap in here that we're trying to get our family practice and get our lifeline connections here booked in mm -hmm. so that it <clears throat> falls right in line. We don't have that done yet, but yeah. come back next year. We, we've got that in my department at Joe's, so we've been standing it up, and we have a great community partner that was the key, uh, Northwest Integrated Health, and Dr. Khan created, you know, next day follow-up for us, but that was the key. And, and the mm -hmm. challenge we have even in the ER, and I'll be transparent, is most of our patients don't come in with withdrawals, and as, you know, initiating people on Suboxone when they used 30 minutes ago is just mean. Uh, and so I, there's some balance, but we've used it a few times. Um, but that's a great segue to say we'd love for Peace Health then to enroll in the opiate feedback programs <coughs> because if you're really getting your surgeons below 15, you would probably be the best performing system in the state. There's our boss. There's my boss right there. I know. The I said that because he's here. Got to have plans. He's one of our greatest supporters. Subtle as a hammer. Uh, so and we'd love for you to drag you know, Peace Health Bellingham with you should you uh, have connections there. Cause, Really, we want to highlight those that are successful and are doing great work. And hopefully, like I said, competition is an amazing driver. And when we did it in the ERs, the CMOs got engaged in the game of like, well, how are we doing and all. So a little friendly rival never hurt. Mm -hmm. um, uh, so from the 75% number, of Terrific. No, I, that's exactly right. We've got to prescribe less and we've got to pull them out. It needs to be a quick in, quick out kind of solution. Great. Any other questions? Want to be cognizant of time? We're right at noon. So, so given the, uh, the, the amount of opioids that are problematic that are coming from multiple providers. 1.8%? Yep. Yep. Why are we emphasizing PMP so much? Why are we emphasizing the PMP well, or other <laughs> we's in the room? I'm just I'm, I want to clarify the we. Uh, <laughs> no, I, there is a role for it, and it does provide you information about their their risk, um, and and hopefully highlights when they're maybe getting a benzodiazepine from their psychiatrist and an, and an opiate from their primary care doctor at that risk. Um, and I, and I think it helped the ERs because we did see them when you finally fired them because they tested cocaine positive for the third time on their chronic opiates, they'd come to the ER and it would take a certain number of times for us to catch them. So it helped us, but like I said, we, we're automatically integrated. I do not prescribe to the PDMP. I'm not, a, I'm not on the PDMP, but I get it on 100% of my patients because it's automatically pushed. So um, I, I do think there's a role for it and you can look at those compliance factors, but that's where it, it should be something that's easy and pushed, not painful and pulled, 
And by doing that, then we'll use it more often. Otherwise, I do think it is unreasonable if a patient's got a clear ankle fracture in front of you to say, well, until you check the PDMP and document a consent form and all this other stuff, we're not gonna give you 15 Vicodin. It's like, th th there is a limit where some clinical judgment and just one more thing shouldn't be introduced. I mean, as an ER doctor, I think the number of state and federal mandates of things we're supposed to screen for in the ER is up to like 17 or 18 things. I mean, Ebola, you know, intimate partner violence, hepatitis something or another, and all your vaccine status, hypertension. Like, there's a list of things we're supposed to scream for. It's like, everybody's idea is wonderful. Just like I think opiates are like, so important. But there are a thousand of things that are so important. And so before we just saying, well, it's just one simple click, we have to stop back and say, well, what are we taking away from it? Are we not gonna have the conversation about obesity and all of the impacts that has on your healthcare? Because instead I spent time logging into the PDMP to be able to decide whether or not to give you 15 Vicodin for your ankle fracture. So I think that's the real calculus and why I do think it should be there. I think it should be a tool, but it should be a tool in the toolkit, not a mandate for providers to log in. It should be a mandate to integrate for large health systems. And we should go away from proprietary software and instead open it up to the free market. Great. Not that I... Well, let's, um, let's give our presenters a hand. Yeah.